Well, uh, in our part two, what we're going to discuss is sequential game, uh, like a sequential games in which uh, the players are, are deciding uh, one after the other, uh, like in which we also want to uh, talk about first mover advantage. Uh, then uh, we have to talk about threats, commitments and credibilities like in the real market, uh, the firms uh, uh, use different types of techniques or strategies in order to uh, create threat for their competitors, uh, commitments, and uh, we also see that uh, these threats and commitments, how credible these are. If they are credible, then they create a deterrence. Uh, otherwise, uh, there is a uh, the the uh, the opponent can understand that these are uh, fake threats or these are uh, not uh, actionable threats. And the last thing we want to discuss is an auction. Now, as I mentioned, sequential game is a game in which uh, the firms are not uh, op, uh, making decisions simultaneously. So, so far what we discuss in our first part is uh, simultaneous games. Both players or all the players are making the decision at the same time. Uh, but in a sequential game, the, uh, the players are making decision one after the other. So, in a sequential game, the key is uh, think uh, through the possible actions and reactions of each player. Suppose that both firms in ignorance of each other's intention must announce their decision independently and simultaneously. In that case, both will probably introduce the sweet serial and both will lose money. In a sequential game, firm 1 introduces a new serial and the firm 2 introduces the 1. And sequential games are normally represented by a tree graph or a uh, extensive form of game, uh, not in a matrix shape. Uh, because by this way it is easy that first who is playing the first is the first player is uh, is a uh, firm one and the second player is a firm two and uh, so extensive form of a game representation of a possible moves in game in the form of a decision tree a productive choice uh, game in an extensive form so when you when we have to find out the equilibrium in this case what we have to do we have to roll back or we have to go backward so firm if the firm two wants to decide uh, which option they're going to decide they're going to decide because the 20 is the payoff so we can cut it uh, and at this node uh, if the firm two has to decide they're going to scroll this one. so now the firm one has to decide so one firm has to decide definitely this option so the equilibrium uh, although this outcomes can be uh, deduce from the payoff matrix sequential games are sometimes easier to visualize uh, if we represent the possible moves in the form of this entry to find the solution to extensive games work backward from the end so as i roll back or a backward induction model we uh, solution we can find it uh, in a extensive game or in a tree shaped games what is called backward induction or a rollback model uh, method to find out the equilibrium now here we see that uh, when there is a sequential game so definitely uh, the firm who is deciding first has a uh, options available more options available but they have to consider while if i make a this decision uh, what is the action of the other one uh, however they have a um, first mover advantage and here we are saying advantage of moving first or we can call it as a first mover advantage. We will use the example in which two duopolists face the market demand curve P is equal to 30 minus Q. Uh, that's a demand curve. Uh, so there are three firms and they can set the price equal to 7.5, 10 or 15. So if, if you see here, if both firms move simultaneously, the only solution to this game is that the both produce 10 and earn 100, 100. So if they, move simultaneously then the outcome of this game is that both gonna produce or uh, 10 10 units uh, but if uh, in in the corno equilibrium each firm is doing the best it can given what is competitor is doing compared to the corno uh, outcome the firm one moves first it does better and the firm two does much worse so if the firm one is deciding first and then the firm two is deciding so then definitely the firm one is going to decide um, 10 and the firm two has an option to decide uh, which one it is uh, 
uh, if they decide first ten, so then ninety three, uh, uh, and then they have an option of deciding uh, seventy five. So uh, the product choice problem and the Stackelberg model are two examples of how how a firm that moves first can create a uh, fait accompli. Fait accompli is a French word that gives it an advantage over its competitors. So in this situation, we will consider what determines which firms goes first. We will focus on the following question. What actions can a firm take to gain advantage in the marketplace? Uh, recall that in a Stackelberg model, the firm that moves first gained an advantage by committing itself to a large output, making a commitment constrained in its future behavior is crucial. So if firm two knows that the firm will respond by reducing the output that if firm uh, if first announced, the firm would produce a large output. The only way that firm can gain a first mover advantage is by committing itself. In fact, firm one constrained firm's two's behavior by uh, constraining its own behavior. Uh, in the product choice between uh, problem uh, in in 13.9, the firm that introduces its new breakfast cereal uh, first will do best. Each has an incentive to commit itself to uh, first to the sweet cereal. So firm must contain uh, constrain its own behavior in a way that uh, convinces firm two that firm one has has no choice but to reduce the uh, to produce the sweet cereal, and firm one might launch uh, an expensive advertising campaign or a contract for the forward delivery of a large quantity of sugar. So you have to create a situation that you are sticking to that decision. Like in this case, uh, if they stick that I'm gonna produce a 15, uh, not 10, like 15. How they can convince it? Uh, and you know, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in business world, uh, many firms are doing press conferences or a, or a media talk. Why they are doing a media talk? No one is interested. A common person is not interested to know what, uh, what uh, raw material or what uh, machinery or what technology they are going to buy to produce the goods. So, the main objective or the main idea behind uh, expressing in the uh, media uh, that what we are going to do uh, is to uh, give a uh, an information to your competitors that I am committed to do this. Uh, by this way, you show your commitment and force the other firms to uh, adopt what you are uh, looking for. So like in this case, uh, you see here crispy and so firm one can convince the firm to how that uh, that firm one is going to produce sweet uh, and the examples are there. So they announce, they advertise, they announce, they buy a large quantity of sugar. So by this way, they convince an incredible convention. Uh, so. Uh, in the product choice uh, problem table, the firm that introduced its new breakfast cereal will do it best and we see that how they can uh, convince it. If it is an empty thread or a fake thread, then uh, it's not going to work. So we'll use the same example in, in which two duopolists face the market demand curve, like uh, P is equal to 30 minus Q. And there are two options or two strategies available, high price, low price. Uh, <clears throat> As long as uh, firm one uh, charges a high price for its computers, uh, both firms can make a good deal uh, of money. Firm one would prefer the outcome in the upper left corner of a matrix like 180. Uh, for firm two, however, charging a low price is clearly a dominant strategy. Thus, the outcomes in the upper right uh, corner will prevail, no matter what the firm set its price first. Uh, can firm one induce firm to charge a high price by threatening to charge a low price if the firm to change to a low price? No. Whatever the firm two does, firm one will much worse off if it is a charge a low price. As a result, its threats is not credible threat. Commitment and credibility. So the, there is a game between two firms: those who are producing small engines or big engines. So how we can, uh, uh, here we have a sequential in which a race car is the leader. Race car will do best by deciding to produce small cars. It knows that in response to his decision, far out will produce small engines, most of which race cars will then buy. Uh, can far out induce a race car to produce big uh, cars instead of small ones? Suppose uh, far out threatened to produce big engines. if race car believe far out threat it would produce a big cars 
but the threat is not credible so far out can make its uh, threat credible by visibly and irreversibly reducing some of its own payoffs in the matrix there by constraining its own choices it might do this by shutting down or destroying some of its small engine production capacity uh, more uh, so now uh, we that th this is a modified game uh, now race car knows that whatever kind of car it produce or far out will produce big engines now it is clearly in race cars uh, interest to produce large cars by taking an action that seemingly put itself at a disadvantage far out has an improved its outcome in the game so all those strategic commitments uh, of a kind can be effective they can uh, they are risky and depend heavily on having accurate knowledge of the payoff matrix and the industry suppose for example that far out commitment itself to producing big engines but it is surprised to find out that another firm can produce small engines at a lower cost so the commitment may then lead far out to bankruptcy rather than continued high profit uh, sometimes uh, they they have to play a uh, for in order to keep their reputation uh, of a certain uh, things uh, developing the right kind of reputation can also give one a strategic advantage suppose that the managers of far out engines develop a reputation for, uh, for being irrational perhaps downright crazy then threaten to produce a big engines no matter what race cars does so sometimes you create a reputation of this that uh, he is a very unpredictable person. So in that case, uh, people are uh, taking a safe or a max min strategy, not to very aggressive strategy. In gaming situation, the partly that is known or thought to be a little crazy can have a significant advantage. Developing a reputation can be uh, an especially important strategy in repeated games. A firm might find it's advantageous to behave irrationally for several plays of the game this might give it a reputation that will allow it to increase its long run profitable sustainability uh, now here is an example of a walmart uh, you know walmart example uh, in every course but here we are looking from a strategic point of view so how did the walmart store succeed where, where other failed um, one of the strategy walmart adopted is that most of the walmarts are in suburbs they mm, mm, very rarely they uh, establish their uh, stores in uh, downtown areas or in in cities the key was a walmart's expansion strategy to charge less than ordinary department stores and small retail stores discount stores rely on size no frills and high inventory turnover uh, through the 1960s the conventional wisdom held that a discount store could succeed only in a city with a population of 100,000 uh, or more sam walton disagreed and decided to open his store in a small southwestern town the store succeeded because walmart has created 30 local monopolies discount stores that had opened in a large towns and cities were competing with with other discount stores which drove down prices and profit margins these small towns however had a room for only one discount store operation so there are a lot of small towns in the United States. So the issue become uh, who would get to each town first. So Walmart now found itself in a uh, preemption, preemption uh, game of the sort illustrated by the payoff matrix. So they created in a way enter, don't enter. So new firms are not entering uh, in, in there. This game has a two Nash equilibria, the lower left corner and the upper right corner. So these are the Nash equilibriums uh, like if we want to find out if Walmart entered the company X is going to do this and if the Walmart don't enter the company is going to enter and the company enter that's, and that's. so these are the two Nash equilibria uh, the trick therefore is to preempt to set up stores in small towns quickly before company X can do so by 1986 it had 1900 stores in operation and was earning an annual profit of 450 million and while other discount chains were uh, going under walmart continued to grow by 1999 uh, walmart had become the world's largest retailer 
with 2454 stores in the United States and another 729 stores in the rest of the world and had an annual sales of 138 billion. In recent years, the Walmart has continued to preempt other retailers by opening discount and grocery stores, Walmart super centers all over the world. So there is a possibility that you can create an entry deterrence like the firms, no new firms enter, uh, like uh, in a price war type of situation. So to deter the incumbent firm must convince any potential competitors that enter will be unprofitable. So if firm X thinks that you will be accommodating and maintaining a high price after it has entered, it will find it profitable to enter and will do so. Suppose you threaten to expand output and wage a price war in order to keep the X out. If X threaten the threat seriously, it will not enter the market because it can expect to lose 10 million. The threat, however, is not credible as uh, once an entry has occurred, it will be in the best interest to accommodate and maintain a high price. Firms X rational move is to enter the market and the outcome will be upper left corner of the matrix. So if you make an irrevocable irre commitment to invest in additional capacity, your threat to engage in competitive warfare is completely credible. With the additional capacity, you will do better in a competitive warfare than you would be maintaining a high price. So meanwhile, having a de deterred entry, you can maintain a high price and earn a profit of 150 million. So if the games were to be indefinitely repeated, then the incumbent might have a rational incentive to engage in warfare uh, whenever entry actually occurs. Why? Because short term loses uh, from warfare might be outweighed by the long term gains from pre preventing event. Finally, by fostering an image of irrational and belligerence, uh, an incumbent firm might convince potential interns that the risk of warfare is too high. So what we discussed in this whole uh, is that how you can create a strategy that the market is working like a uh, oligopoly and you not new firms enter. So uh, you, if you create a credible uh, threat or a deterrence, then the new firm will not enter. So you can create this by, uh, by making a reputation of irrational behavior or uh, aggressive behavior. So by this way, there are different ways or you can show so strategic uh, trade policy and international competition, uh, given the virtues of free trade, how can government intervention in an international market uh, ever be warranted? In certain situations, a country can benefit by adopting policies that give its domestic industries a competitive advantage. By granting subsidies or tax breaks, the government can encourage domestic firms to expand faster than they would otherwise. This might prevent firms in other countries from entering the world market so that the domestic industry can enjoy high prices and greater sales. Such a policy worked by a credible threat of to potential entrants. Large domestic firms taking advantage of scale economies would be able to satisfy world demand at a low price. If other firms entered, price would be driven down, driven below the point at which they, can, they could make a profit. So here is an example of an entry deterrence by uh, Boeing and Airbus. So suppose that Boeing and Airbus, a European consortium that includes France, Germany and Britain and Spain. Uh, this is a Airbus and Boeing is an American firm and each considering developing a new aircraft. The ultimate payoff to each firm depends in part on what the other firms does. Uh, suppose it is only economical for one firm to produce the new craft. So we see here uh, produce not don't produce so if Boeing, if Boeing has a head start in the development process, the outcome of the game is upper right hand corner of the pair P of matrix like this Boeing is going to be at Z and the European government of course would prefer if the Airbus uh, produce the new aircraft. If the European government commit to, subs uh, to subsidy this 20 to the Airbus, if it produce the plane regardless of what Boeing does, the pair P of matrix gonna be changed like this. So Boeing knows that even if it commits to producing, Airbus will produce as well and the Boeing will lose money. So thus the Boeing decide not to produce and the outcome will be the one in the left on this one. 
so a subsidy of 20 then uh, change the outcome from one of of which airbus does not produce and earn zero to one in which it does produce and earn 120 so of this 100 is a transfer of profit from united states to europe from the european point of view subsidizing airbus yield a high return european governments did commit to subsidize airbus and during the 1980s airbus successfully introduced several new aer airplanes as a commercial air travel grew it becomes clear that both companies could profitably develop and sell new airplanes nevertheless boeing's market share would have been much larger without the european subs subsidies to the airbus uh, industry is transforming a ride share service allow you to use an app on your smartphone to request a ride to destination of your choice taxi companies have tried to tatter the entry of a uber and lyft by lobbying the city government to impose regulations but these efforts have largely failed and the ride share companies have grown rapidly and we see uh, they are expanding all the time uh, their operations in different cities as well as uh, the market share in existing uh, where they are uh, still uh, they are already operating uh, ride share services however are subject to strong network externalities you are more likely to choose the service that has the most drivers like uh, wise if you are a driver you would probably want to have a, as many customers as possible which means working with the service that has the most customers so these differences uh, raise an important question is there a room in the uh, in this market for two uh, ride share services or is the network externality so strong that we will end up with only one winner while uber may dominate in some cities lyft can push the hard for, for dominance in the other cities and indeed in 1926 uh, 20, uh, in 2016 uh, lyft was nearing 50 percent of the rides in los angeles san francisco and austin Texas, according to the Lyft president John Zimmer, the, this continues to provide what we said all along, which is once you hit a certain level of scale, it is natural duopoly. We will eventually find out whether he is right. The last thing we want to discuss is a uh, auction, and auction means that you want to sell something uh, in the market and. Uh, buyers are uh, sitting in front of you or in any other way so now digitally or a, on a, some uh, social media is also possible that you can auction auction market in which products are bought and uh, sold through formal bidding process auctions are used for differentiated products normally auctions are for antiques unique paintings uh, sculptures diamonds jewelries uh, these type of things are normally auctioned. Uh, sometimes the commercial things like uh, uh, airport uh, landing slots or uh, these types of things are also auctioned. Um, the main uh, nowadays uh, uh, the uh, spectrum, uh, the air spectrum or uh, the, these uh, signaling uh, for uh, these uh, cellular companies, they are uh, bidding for uh, spectrum. Um, space uh, auctions are used for different products especially unique items that don't have a established market value such as an art a tea, antique sports uh, memoria uh, memorabilia and the rest uh, uh, rights to extract oil from the piece of land they are likely to be less time consuming than one on one bargaining and they encourage competition among buyers in a way that increase the seller's revenue auction create large savings in transaction cost and thereby increases the efficiency of the market the design of an auction which involves choosing the value under which it operates greatly affects its outcome. A seller will usually want an auction format that maximizes the revenue from the sale of the product. On the other hand, a buyer collecting bids from a group of potential sellers uh, will want an auction that minimizes the expected cost of the product. So they are, these are the different types of auctions. Uh, English or oral auction, auction in which a seller actively solicits progressively higher bids from a group of potential buyers so uh, so there is a auctioner uh, the uh, the product is in front of the public and he motivate the people to increase the bid and finally he done the bid like one two three done and that's the higher bidder will get it 
a dutch auction auction in which a seller begins by offering an item at a relatively high price and then reduce it by the fixed amount under the item is sold so they started with a certain value uh, if there is a bidder they bid it uh, close to that if there is no bidder he reduced the price and then there is a close bidder so by this way uh, they are starting from the uh, sealed bid auction in which every participant is uh, providing in, uh, his uh, uh, willingness to pay for that product auction in which the bids are made simultaneously in a sealed envelope the winning bidder being the individual who has submitted the highest bid uh, first price auction auction in which the seal uh, sales price is equal to the highest bidder uh, second price auction auction in which the sales price is equal to the second highest bidder valuation and information private value auction auction in which each bidder knows his or her individual valuation of the object uh, uh, up for bid which valuation offering from bidder to bidder common value auctioning auctioning in which the firm has the same value to all bidders but bidders do not know what value precisely and their estimate is of a vary uh, in a real life example ebay is a uh, site website where you can get it you can bid for certain things uh, the popularity of auctions has skyrocketed with the growth of internet however in the past decades the auction format for internet sales has fallen in popularity as consumers have moved towards buying and selling at fixed prices the most frequently used internet auction site continues to be ebay ebay continued success over competitors uh, such as yahoo and amazon is due to the presence of a strong network externalities both sellers and buyers uh, gravitate uh, gravitate the uh, to the auction site with the largest market share so auctions are also used widely by the us government one of the most important auctions is for the sale of a spectrum in which the government licenses the right to offer wireless services in a particular geographic area so the spectrum auctions not only raise uh, considerable revenue but they also offer a more efficient allocation process by encouraging competition and fostering the development of a new wireless services the us government has also raised money through oil and timber auctions full estate in an oil and auction uh, company submitted 148 bids on 128 blocks in the gulf so this is all what we want to discuss uh, from uh, game theory perspective and uh, by this way we cover the whole 13 chapters in this course and this is our final chapter for this course of intermediate microeconomics i hope you enjoyed this uh, videos of all these chapters uh, uh, if you have any suggestion or any comment please do write below the videos as a comment uh, that will be helpful for me to further improve my uh, videos thank you very much